All right, welcome everybody. I'm going to give you a list of three main threads of logic today, but let's get started with some classical ones. The first thing you may think about with the word of logic is just the simple idea of true or false. But is there anything else? I have here a picture of my dog riding in the back of a truck. The question could be, is it true or false that dogs love trucks? From this picture, you might get the right opinion that this dog seems to love a truck. But I want to ask a simpler question. Is the statement true or false, dogs love truck, even a logical one? Can we think about this having an answer? So let's think about some of the issues that emerge. Is it all dogs? Is it all trucks? Or is it some dogs and some trucks? We have to see that the statement doesn't make it clear what kind of a claim we're making. We might have some guesses, but without knowing for sure, we'd be really misunderstanding the statement. It might be true that some dogs love trucks, or it might be true that all dogs love trucks, or maybe they love some trucks, but not all trucks. We can see the nuance emerging pretty quickly. We should add to our logic ways to decipher which of these many different ways we think about we really want. The second thing is, words like love can mean something very subtle and outside of what a logical framework can provide. We have to be careful that we don't start using words like this in hopes that everybody understands it the same way we do. The word love is a great word to use, but it might not be as good as a logical word to use. And finally, we should ask ourselves, what counts as evidence? If we have evidence for something, we think of it sometimes as a proof. We'd like to know that it is true or is false that a dog loves a truck. We would need to clarify for each other and for ourselves, what are we even counting as our evidence? That's a straightforward example in this case, but now let's try to put some context to this, some rules that'll let us make this into mathematics. The first thing is, we're gonna to try to make judgments about only some of the things that we might say. We'll call these things sentences or statements of logic. So a logical sentence or statement is one where we bother to judge that it's possibly true. Doesn't mean it has to be true, it could be false, but we bother to make such a statement. Sometimes we use the words well-formed, for example, we would not bother to do much if there was bad grammar or symbols that don't make any sense. If I write x minus equals 7 root, it's not clear what I mean that to be. Maybe I meant it to be negative x equals the square root of 7, or maybe it's just a nonsense phrase. We don't bother to judge true or false a statement that doesn't have any meaning. We have to start by something that has the right kind of grammar. At minimum, you should be able to read it out loud. The other thing we want to do is avoid words that don't really have a meaning to the context. For example, we already talked about love being something that might be difficult to capture with logic. Similarly, if I just made up a symbol, this phrase I have here, Flubergarten und Elevendi. Elevendi is not a number, and Flubergarten is a made-up phrase. Und is a German word for and, so that might have some logical meaning. But what I have to be careful of is that I don't bring meaning from a place that not everybody is in. If you don't understand this language, it isn't logical to you. So we have to remember that we're only going to give truth to statements that we can all understand. We'll have to get into later a concept of context, which will clarify what we mean. So sentences are statements that can be made true. Could be asked, judged to be true or false. Now we get into the statements that we need to think about. We're going to try to think about logic mostly in what's called classical truth. This is called classical logic, and it's the most popular one in most scientific settings. In this situation, a sentence that's well-formed is judged as true or false exclusively. We're not going to allow a mixture of these two. So for example, 2 plus 3 equals 5. That's a sentence. It has a verb, it has a noun, a direct object, everything we need to make a sentence. It's also one that is easy to see is true, at least if you understand what two, three, and five are. So I would say that's a true sentence in classical logic. Notice I'm allowed to write things that are not true and still talk about them as sentences. For example, the quantity two plus three squared equals two squared plus three squared. Now we know that isn't true. Two plus three squared is really five squared or 25. On the other side, 2 squared is 4, 3 squared is 9, 4 plus 9 is 13, which is not 25. So here we've written a sentence, and we've judged it. It turned out to be false. That's still allowed in classical logic. 
Now, normally, in order to avoid confusion, we try not to leave sentences on the board that we know to be false. So when we know it to be false, we include words like not in front. Here we would say it's just not equal. These two expressions are saying the same thing, but one of them is true and one of them is false. The one with the equal sign is false. The one with the not equal sign is true. We can also have words, and often in mathematics, especially as we start to blend it with data science and computation, we'll have to start to think about story problems instead of formulas. And so it can look very non-mathematical, and it, we can struggle to see the logic in sentences. But nevertheless, the sentence is the grounding of what might be true or false. So let's read this sentence and then see if it's something we might judge as true or false. If it rains, then the ground will be wet. This is a statement that we can judge as true, but of course it assumes many things. We're assuming that we understand what rain and ground are. These are all some of the things we'll discuss when we get to the concept of context. But given your usual experience in everyday life, if it rains then the ground will be wet is something you might judge as true. This is the most common type of logic in the sciences and especially in mathematics. It's called classical logic because it emerged in some of the original types of sciences. It is, however, no better or worse than all the other logics we'll discuss next. It's just the one that's used most often in the sciences. Now let's turn to something called intuitionistic truth or intuitionistic logic. Here we still maintain the same concepts of classical logic in that we talk about exclusive truth and false. However, unlike a judgment where we don't explain why something is true, in intuitionistic logic we require that truth only come from evidence. You can't have any other reason to think that something is true. You must provide a proof of it or evidence. Let's give some examples of this. Here's a sentence that might surprise you. What I have is a two-part function. I have a function that takes in an integer. If the integer is even, it divides it by two. If the integer is not even, so it's odd, then it takes three times that number plus one. Now let's try this out for a particular number. Suppose that I take the number four. 4 is even. 4 divided by 2 becomes 2, which is still even, so I apply it again. f of 2 is now 2 over 2, which is 1, which is now odd. And there we stop. We got to 1. Now let's try a different input. Let's try the number 5. If I put the number 5 in, 5 is odd, so it goes into the second case and turns 5 into 3 times 5 plus 1. So that's 15 plus 1, which is now 16. When I put 16 in, it'll be even, and so we'll start dividing by 2. 16 divided by 2, that's 8. 8 divided by 2, that's 4. That's still even. 4 divided by 2, that's still even. It'll get back to 1. So we have this conjecture. This is called the Cowlitz conjecture. The question is whether this function, if you keep applying it, will always end in the number 1. So far, no one has found an example which doesn't end in the number one. But they also have no reason to know that it will end in the number of one. That's why it's called a conjecture. It's an unsolved problem. No one can give evidence whether this does or does not end in one. So in an intuitionistic truth model, we would not be able to say that this is true or false. We would just leave it open to question. In some ways, you might say this is a version of classical logic. It's just one where we're being a little bit more faithful about what we know today and what we know tomorrow. However, people argue if whether there is a real philosophical difference. The intuitionist would say it may not even have a truth, whereas the classical person would say you just don't know the truth yet. Whether these is right or wrong for you will depend on what your application is. Let it be said, it is yet another form of mathematics. Here's another statement, try to move to the story problem world. If you visit a bad website, then you will receive unwanted emails. I want to claim that this is similar in nature to our above Cowlitz conjecture. It's harder to process what everything means. We have to, again, appeal to a context. But I think your everyday life understands that there are good websites and bad websites, and a bad website may harvest your information and use it to send you unwanted emails. It's possibly true. Is that a proof? Is that evidence? It's an experiential evidence, but it would struggle to have actual proof that every bad website would send you some unwanted emails. It might also be true even without the bad website. You might receive unwanted emails no matter what you do. So this statement could still be true even with different evidence. 
the point about intuitionistic truth is that we want to get at the mechanisms for why something happens. You receive unwanted emails because you went to a bad website. That's a stronger statement than saying you receive unwanted emails and it happened to coincide with being at a bad website. This is the nuance that intuitionistic logic can make that's different from classical logic. In classical logic, you really couldn't say that there was a difference between receiving bad email and visiting this website. In intuitionistic logic, you're required to show the process that visiting a bad website produces unwanted email. It's an evidence-based logic, and that's the key point of it, not philosophical debates. Why is this useful in your journey? Well, if you go into computer science, we often have to discuss programs as a form of logic. And programs definitely need data. They can't guess what your answer should be. They need to start with evidence to produce a result for you. And this means that what we can do with computers is limited to this intuitionistic logic. It can't achieve everything that you might do on a chalkboard in, say, classical logic. This is why computers aren't there to replace our scientist. The scientist can go a step further than the intuitionistic logic can do. So this is a great logic if you're going into computer science. But that's not the only situation that you'll need to worry about. There's also paraconsistent truth. This one's a very important upcoming type of logic because of data science applications. Let's get into it first with the philosophy. This one's a little bit confounding because the point of a paraconsistent truth is that there are sentences that are true or false, or possibly both. Now you might feel like this can't be right. How can something be true and false? It feels like that's a contradiction in what those words even mean. But there's a nuance here. Let's take a very simple example. This sentence is false. This is often known as the liar paradox. If you try to think about this too long, you realize what the subtlety is. If the sentence is actually true, then it is also false. It's both. And if the sentence is false, well, the complement of false would be true. So then it's true. So in some ways, you get into a circular argument where you can never decide that it's purely true or purely false. It seems to be both at the same time. Many people have argued how you should fix this paradox. But the main rule of a paradox is to point out that your logic is doing something that wasn't what you predicted, wasn't what you expected. And you have to now manage the outcome. In paraconsistent logic, you allow some sentences like this, but you don't allow every sentence to be like this. You simply allow the ones that have confounding information, and you allow them to exist because it's easier for the rest of your reasoning to simply accept their existence. Now, the liar paradox is fun, but it's not really a useful tool to answer. But there are many problems in modern day data science which really ask upon questions like this paradox. Let's imagine this very simplified version of a database, it's student heights. We see there are students that have heights 5, 6, 5, 5, 50, and 6. Regardless of what the units are, probably feet, you can see that 50 seems like a strange number to have as a height of anybody compared to all the other numbers. Now the claim is that the average height is 5.4. You can tell right away from the data here this can't be the right average because any average that involves a number like 50 is going to blow that number up quite a bit. So you could make the claim that this had to be false, that the real average is probably something like 12.8. However, the second view is that this is obviously meant to be excluding 50. If you look at the data, 50 is an outlier. It shouldn't have counted towards the average height, and that's why it wasn't computed in the average height of 5.4. Both of these perspectives have a bit of truth to them. The raw data is actually pointing to 12.8, but the fact that 50 is an outlier is also suggesting we don't include it, giving us a 5.4. Many situations in data science actually are modeled well by taking the perspective that perhaps your data is both true and false in some situations. That depends on how you want to think about the situation. It could be that you're thinking of we don't have enough evidence to rule out 50. Maybe there really was a really tall person at some point. Maybe there is some reason to go back and reach set your data, or maybe there's not. The key thing is to be clear to other people about what our arguments are here for. If you include a paraconsistent logic in your arsenal, you'll be able to include more story problems in your reasoning. That's why it's here. It's to allow us to reason about things better. 
So you'll find this existing in many existing data science applications, and it'll be useful as you go forward. It's great for modeling noise and errors. So here's a quick summary of the logics we've seen. We will mostly do classical logic. This is just where things are true and false, and everybody gets one of these two assignments. So the whole world is either blue or red. If in some situations it's important that you back everything up by evidence, such as I need a computer program to tell me this, then you'll want to switch to intuitionistic logic. Here the world shrinks a little bit. We'll have the things in blue that we have evidence for being false and the things in red that we have evidence for being true, but there may be things outside of that boundary that we might have a different color for, places where we don't have evidence. Or we may switch to something like a paraconsistent logic, where we can have things that are allowed to be true and false they're mostly separated, but on occasions, because we can't tell the difference, we might shade them a mixed color of true and false, and it just warns us to follow the logic under the hint that we might be wrong or right. So what are the consequences of these models? The whole point isn't to memorize these words and walk around like a dictionary. The point is to be able to look at your story problem and pick what's right for you. And in particular, I want you to think of the fact that classical is great in the sciences, intuitionistic is great for computer science computations, and paraconsistent is great for data sciences. But what are the consequences, or some of them, for doing these choices? The first one I want to point out is the law of explosion. This one really matters for how you argue with one another and with programs. In both quantum computing, sorry, not quantum computing, in both classical computing and intuitionistic logic, those are the first two models, we have the following rule of explosion. If you find evidence that something is false, sorry, if you find evidence for something that is actually false, then everything is false. Let me say this very clearly. Suppose that I work very hard to write a proof out, and in writing the proof, I discover that it says two equals seven. I know two does not equal seven. I am therefore forced to throw everything I've done away. It's evidence that it's all false. Now, the way we like to think about this is that it lets us know that somewhere in our assumptions, we added some assumption which can't be true alongside everything else we know. We call this a counterexample. Now, this is a rule, not a fact. The law of explosion is something we add to our logics in order to reason. But it means that when something is not true, you just need one reason for it to fall apart. We call that a counterexample. Meanwhile, in paraconsistent, you can't have anything fall, trigger or fall apart because we allow true and false to overlap. So in paraconsistent logic, you won't get away with one counterexample. You'll have to have a few or a better reason for explaining why something is truly false. Now, paraconsistent as not having the principle of explosion, one mistake doesn't percolate out to everywhere. This is why we want this in data science applications. A little bit of noise in your data shouldn't mean you throw all the data away. But on the other hand, Having a counterexample is a great way to say stop thinking this way when you're trying to be a scientist. If you find something that shows that your claim, your hypothesis is false, one claim can't be true if it's not always true. So in the classical sciences, you want to throw things away once you find one counterexample. But in the data sciences, you might be doing too much. Maybe there's errors in the data that you can't know about, so you should wait till you get more evidence. Probability is in that paraconsistent model classical logic is in the programming and mathematical model. A final word of warning. There's a famous theorem that you may have even heard through other sources called Gödel's incompleteness theorem. It is not the topic of this course, but it's a fun claim to think about. It says the following, some sentences are true and have no evidence. What this is really trying to say is not a statement about the kind of logic. This statement is true in classical logic, intuitionistic logic and paraconsistent logic. What it's is saying is that there's a limit to what evidence can do about proving truth. When we don't have a statement that is proved, it might still be something that you can't prove is false either. It's a state of balance of whether some everything has to have an explanation behind it. It turns out we can't always insist that everything have an explanation, regardless of the kind of logic we have. Now, you're not likely to fall upon these in everyday life, but oh, sorry, in, in mathematics, because they're very technical. But in everyday life, you'll probably hit situations where on the regular, you feel like this is one you can't assign as true or false. For example, do dogs love trucks? Until next time.